Oh, London, where the clouds never go away. Sorry, just think, taking a return trip to London just brings out the music in me. London, one of my uh, most famous, de- uh, fa- my, my, one of my most favorite destinations. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, without Ryan here, it, it can be hard to riff everybody. One of my favorite destinations. I actually lived in London for a year, and I used to go back for weeks and weeks for work, um, which was such a pleasure at the time. I miss it desperately. I haven't been back uh, since before the pandemic. But uh, I go there often in my mind and by uh, listening to the London episodes, the many London episodes in the Out of Office archives. And this one I specially chose because it celebrates the obscure museums of London. You know, London is home to lots of big, impressive museums. You've got the the British Museum, Victoria and Albert Museum. You've got the the Natural History Museum. This episode takes you to that, the the small, the the quirky, the passion projects. And uh, this is where I love to search out when you've exhausted those big museum collections. Um, London is absolutely packed with them because uh, the history goes back so far. So I hope you enjoy uh, this, this tour, this part one tour. Hint, hint, there might be another return trip in the future. Uh, the part one tour of the obscure museums of London. I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. Hi, Ryan. What's going on? Uh, I mean, today, this is the first episode we are officially doing a two-parter. In advance, because you you sometimes surprise people with that second two-parter, you know. I've, you <laughs> You're know, talking about the Mark Adams like, bonus material. Hey, I did a four-hour interview. <laughs> I've got more material for you, you know. <laughs> Listen, I can't help it if I'm a great interviewer. All right, today is part one of two, and the theme is... Obscure Museums of London. The Hidden Museums of London. No, no. They're not hidden. They're obscure. You can find, actually, some of them are hard to find, but most of them you will be able to find fairly easily. Okay, so they're not like, it's not like you have to go behind a special wall or something. These are, um, you can Google them and find there them. There is one where you have to go down below a floor. So, so you know, they, they are obscure. They're not, the, I, what I'm trying to say is they're not the British Museum. They're not the Victoria and Albert Museum. The, the, you know, the, 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 those are the, the kind of blockbusters. These are the ones that really need your love, need your dollars. Well, need your pounds, I should say. Yeah, or, or need your euros. Uh, no, uh, well, no, 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 no. 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 They never got on the air. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, well, so, you know, I don't even know what I, you're saying. It's, it's a real currency, you know? It's gonna, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm saying. All right. Well, uh, listen, I, I'm anxious to get to the Obscure Museums of London. We're going to cover six today. I got seven for next time. I will say I had to delete one because it no longer does tours, I'm sad to say. Now, that is an obscure museum. It was, it was so <laughs> obscure that they just had to close down. <laughs> Uh, but maybe maybe I'll just give you a little teaser about that at the end. But listen, first, we got to talk about an update on the quest for Rick Steves. <laughs> the quest for Rick Steves? Now, uh, Ryan, you, you recall, you know, we started this podcast. We had a quest. We had something we were working towards. Right. We needed a perfect tagline. And, so and we found it. We found, exactly. Week this by taken. week. We, we worked yeah. at it, we, we prepared, we, we brainstormed, we, we got there over we many accept, weeks. We accepted feedback? Y- yeah, I ignored a lot more feedback yeah, but we than accepted I accepted. It. But yeah. yeah. And um, uh, today, we now have a quest for Rick Steves. This is to get uh, the travel writer Rick Steves, a uh, PBS personality, uh, you know, a man about town. We, we've interviewed him before, right? We did an episode where we had him on. No, 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 no. That what you're thinking of is an episode where I put Rick Steves in the title, but it was oh, just, it was just a that love. That was just you. It was yeah, just, it was just, just a just love letter to, to Rick right, Steves. Right. Oh, it was just right, me right. trying to, you know, prime the pump, if you will. <laughs> okay, I got gotcha. you. Know, yeah. I, I, I'm a Keynesian. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so we, we primed the pup with the love letter. We launched the quest for Rick Steves. Now I've got an important update. He's coming on the show. What? No, oh. no. The quest is not over yet. I mean, oh. what would a quest be if it didn't take twists and turns? We, we're going to take one step forward, two steps back sometimes. That's <laughs> the nature of a quest. I believe that. That <laughs> I believe. <laughs> well, listen, I believe today qualifies as one step forward. 
Uh, this Justin. Now, do you know the Boston Pops? Have you ever heard of the Boston Pops? I I've, I've, I have PBS, so yeah, I've, I've heard of the Boston sure. Pops. You know, they're most famous for their uh, 4th of July extravaganza. They play some great patriotic music while fireworks explode over Boston. They've got a number of uh, holiday uh, CDs that are very enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> You're really selling them. Very 4th good. of July is a holiday, very by the way. Good. So and they you appear still, in and, many holidays. And you can still get that CD. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, it turns out that Rick Steves has a program here in Boston on June 13th, Thursday, June 13th. It's called The Journey with Rick Steves. And are you ready? I'm going to read to you uh, straight from the press release. America's leading authority on European travel. I mean, we know who that is, right? This is Rick Steves. I, I couldn't have written that better myself. Yeah, there's no need to even name him. Amer- exactly. We all know. Uh, hashtag America's leading authority on European travel. As he and the Boston Pops transport you on a musical voyage. Mr. Steve's extensive knowledge of European history and culture set the context for each piece as the orchestra performs a selection of stirring 19th century anthems by Romantic era composers. Each selection honors a particular nation, while the finale, Beethoven's Ode to Joy, Europe's official anthem, pays homage to the continent's motto of United in Diversity. The concert is enhanced by a montage of evocative video images curated by none other than Rick Steves. It is. I am. I am so glad that the uh, the Boston Pops are finally getting around to playing music from European composers. <laughs> All these years of these ignored composers, uh, I, they're gonna they're gonna you know we're gonna hear some Mozart. We're gonna hear some Beethoven. It's gonna be a we're really gonna celebrate that diversity. I mean, Rick of, Steve, uh, has Rick Steves ever been riding more high? He's got the guide. But I mean, this guy's been around since yeah. the nineteen seventies. Yeah. Suddenly, he's in New York Times profiles. He's getting called. I mean, I don't even really know what he does on this. Like, he picked the music. Music, well, I think. He, yeah, well, I think we're just watching basically a slideshow of his vacation yeah. for two and a half hours <laughs> right. to like a generic European, uh, yeah. Um, no, I think this is going to be uh, stirring, and I can think of no one better to lead you through a European journey than Rick Steves. I, 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 I'm I, very torn as to whether I should go to this or not because well, I— he should just bring by. He could swing by the old pod studio uh, I, and and do and do the do the show right then. This is what I'm thinking. But yeah. you know, his PR people told me he's busy until December. But I, I maybe they didn't know that I, I live very convenient to the Boston Pops. Yeah, you and you have a, a you know season subscription to the Pops. I imagine, right? No, no, I don't have no. a season subscription to the Pops. I've gone once to the Christmas Spectacular. Um, one time they had a a, a great reading of uh, the, the Grinch. Who stole Christmas? It was very uh, moving, but uh, I, you know, are, are, are the, uh, the the Rock Cats in Boston are they sort of like uh, Irish? Oh, that's step right. Dancers? That's the Christmas spectacular. Yeah. That's, <laughs> oh, what do they call it? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I went to a Christmas concert. Hey, it's a have. Christmas pretty good. Yeah, you know? yeah, sure. <laughs> And, um, uh, it, but I think that if Rick Steves had been there, it, it could have just been uh, all the brighter. And I kind of feel like if I go, I'm saying like it's okay that he came to Boston without engaging with me, you know? So. I've really got some things to think about. I, 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 I will say I sent the love letter episode to uh, the PR folks. And so I think that this is good, good, good reason for a follow up. And he didn't follow with a cease and desist. So I feel like things are still again, a, a, as I always say, one step forward, no cease and desist. That's a, every day we go without a cease and desist is another step forward. So we'll take some hits back. So hopefully, I, I you know maybe maybe I'm going to get a guest seat at this. I, I'm expecting that I probably will. So uh, journey with Rick Steves, the Boston Pops, Thursday, June thirteenth. That's your update, and uh, one step closer to getting him here in Beantown, and, and I feel one step closer to getting him right here in the podcast. Well, I think uh, while you stew on if you're going to go uh, stalk Rick Steves at his, his dressing room door. You know, it mentioned uh, that the, the continent's motto is united in diversity. What do you think the British are going to feel about that? Are the British Europeans still? I thought they were like, well, eh. they're tech- they, opt- they're, they opted well, out. They're one, no, they're one foot in still. Yeah. They've got a little bit of time. <laughs> you know, it could be it's a TBD if there's any kind of situation. Well, do, you, do you think post Brexit they're going to need to change United in diversity? I well, I guess England wasn't really yeah. di- a ton of diversity. It wasn't like England was bringing, bringing the diversity. You know, I like, don't know. They had quite the empire. That's a lot of diversity. Right-handed, uh, right, right-handed soccer players and left-handed soccer players. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's the diversity that Britain has. Weak tea drinkers and strong <laughs> tea drinkers. 
All right. Well, Ryan, I, I'm excited. Uh, I think, uh, you know, no one more diverse than Rick Steves to, to lead that United in Diversity uh, uh, concert. Well, Kiernan, do you think it's uh, time to take off? I think it's absolutely time to take off. We got to get to London. Let's get to London. Cabin crew, let's take off. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. All right, Ryan, today, uh, part one of a two-part series, Obscure Museums of London. Now, Ryan, you know I lived for a year in jolly old London. You have never let me forget it in any no, conversation no. we've ever Fantastic. had. Fantastic. Yeah. One of my proudest years. And, uh, and then w- with work, I used to go back uh, two, three weeks a year. Uh, for for about four or five years there, so very familiar uh, with the, the 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 great when as as nobody calls it, but it used to be called because <laughs> when means like an open wound. So, um, you know that was like when there was sewage on the streets and such. And um, one of the things that I love about London is uh, the proliferation of wonderful museums that they have there. Because you know I'm a real sucker for museums that are a bit off the beaten track. Yeah, and London is a very old city. It's got a, a rich history. So, you know, uh, just because there's not a whole lot happening there now doesn't mean that, you know, before I, there was know, an astonishing amount of stuff. And my wife, Catherine, fundamentally doesn't understand <laughs> your character on the podcast because <laughs> it's like you think nowhere outside of Bushwick matters. And it's like you forget this is a travel podcast. No, I— we, we love traveling to all of these places. I, I also love London, and I just like to tease London a bit because as a New Yorker— you know, it's it's uh, it's sort of our, our like frenemy city. But well, I thought that was Boston. Boston thinks that we're frenemies, but New York doesn't. <laughs> New York doesn't even have so a, you know, Boston's saying, number programmed in their phone. So you know? what you're saying is we're friends. All right, Boston <laughs> and New York are friends. London and New York frenemies. Glad we got to the bottom of that. Um, Ryan, you're, you're talking uh, that London goes back a long way. You're yes. absolutely right about that. And that gets to my first pick, the number one obscure museum of London. This is the London Roman Amphitheater. London had a Roman amphitheater? That's exactly right. So now, Ryan, did you, un- did you know that London was at one point part of the Roman Empire? Uh, I did, loosely. I knew that, yeah. Yeah, because what most people know uh, from Bath, I think. Bath, England, they know if you go there, you see Roman baths, and that's where it takes its name from, and that's the great museum there. And uh, surely we'll talk about that on a future episode. But what's, uh, what's important is that London was, was the largest, greatest city of Roman Britain. And what period is this, that, that, that it is the largest, greatest city of Roman Britain? Well, it began in like uh, 47 AD, okay. and, and it grew over time to be quite a major trading hub for all the reasons you'd expect. You know, it's got easy access to the ocean through the Thames. It's close enough to the continent to be able to bring things over, um, and, and uh, it, you know, it, it, it's a maritime nation. And uh, London actually became quite a thriving city, one of the most significant Roman cities outside of the Mediterranean region. And, um, you know, as most uh, major Roman cities had to have, they had a, a, a big amphitheater. And this is where uh, you would get, you know, your wild animal fights. So maybe throw some bears in there, some lions go crazy. Uh, you, you'd get your, your public executions. Uh, you know, I imagine at some points maybe the Christians were in there. It did, did they have a production of Phantom of the Opera that played in there? Or is this pre-Android now, Weber? You know London? what? They, they didn't have a roof, so I think the chandelier drop would have been— Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to— <laughs> Should I spoiler alert for that? <laughs> spoiler alert. Uh, no chandelier drop in the Roman amphitheater. I like to think that— uh, Actually, a, a production of Oliver, I think, would be great in the round. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it would be fantastic. Or cats. They could just run all around you in a circle. I, I don't encourage a production of cats in any theater. That's true. Um, and um, so, so you got the, the wild animal fights, the executions, and of course the gladiator fights. And these were uh, popular entertainments for the hoi ploy. And what's amazing is uh, bits of this Roman London, which by the way, it was called in the time Londinium, which I, I think is a wonderful fact. You could take that to your favorite British friends and tell them, oh, I, have you, I'm going to visit Londinium. And, and they will say, what are you talking about? And then you can explain all about how it used to be a Roman city. And uh, there are bits and pieces around London. You can, go, you can still see bits of the Roman city wall. Um, you, you can actually go below some modern buildings and still see pieces of that. And, um, but, you know, as you'd expect in all these ruins, they're all a bit below ground level. And that's t- true also of this Roman amphitheater. And there's a full museum where uh, you can go in and you can see the outline of where the amphitheater was. And they still have the stone entrance gate, the east gate, and the arena walls. 
So is this in uh, the area close to where, like the West End, where the theater district is now in London, or a totally different location? So this is more in the historic area. It's called the the City of London, which is the more traditional old era area. So if you go towards where, like the Tower of London is, St. Paul's, it's in that area. Um, and it's particularly in a place called Guildhall Yard. And this is where many of the trade guilds used to have their, their uh, corporations and houses there. And they actually have above ground uh, a, a, a plaza where they've outlined in black brick exactly where the Roman amphitheater used to stand. And then you can go into the museum, which is below that, where you can see the ruins themselves. So there are actually surviving ruins. It's not It's not just a basement, that museum of what was the ruins. No, there no, are. I, there are some ruins there, though. I mean, it's not like, you know, you're not walking into the Colosseum. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I would have known if there was a Colosseum in London. You know, that would have been... What I like about when I when I think of these uh, amphitheaters is, uh, you know, they're very bloody. I mean, a lot of bloody stuff. You got the executions, the gladiator fights, and I found uh, this great quote from Saint Augustine. You know, I can't I can't resist bringing in a saint's quote if I find one. And he was talking about uh, the the power of when you get into these like bloodthirsty crowds. Uh, so it, it, this is what he said. He opened his eyes, feeling perfectly prepared to treat whatever he might see with scorn. He's talking about what he'd see in an amphitheater. He saw the blood and he gulped down the savagery. He was no longer the man who had come there, but was one of the crowd to which he had come. You know, so you think you're going to go in and be sort of the good sport, not wanting to see all the blood, but you can't resist it. You, you know, I, I know when I was there, I, I, was, I, was, I was ready to see something just ripped piece for piece. That, I mean, he could have been describing a Trump rally. And, you know, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That was what jumped in my head when you were reading that quote. Yeah, I think uh, I, I like to think that the Romans were a little more civilized than that. <laughs> it's true. It's true. They read more. So Exactly. Now, uh, Ryan, uh, moving on to the second pick for Obscure Museums of London, I believe you've actually been to this one, right? I have. The last time I was in London last year, um, I, I asked you for uh, some obscure recommendations, and this was your number one uh, recommendation to me. So this is uh, a museum called Sir John Soane's Museum. Sir John Soane was a 19th century architect and collector of antiquities and art. And basically, over his lifetime, he bought up three houses, he demolished them, and he built this one big, beautiful, palatial mansion in which he could house his collection and his personal home. Yeah, he filled this mansion with an incredible, eclectic, weird amount of stuff. Yeah, like if I had to compare it to uh, museums in the U.S., I would say it is most like the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum here in Boston— or in Philadelphia, the uh, Barnes Collection, which were both great collectors who had very specific ways that they wanted to see the art preserved and and uh, presented in their homes. Yeah, and this would—it's sort of like if you walked into one of the Koch brothers' like townhouses on the Upper West Side. Yeah, know? though John Soane made it. I mean, don't drag his name through the mud. Sure, he was a rich <laughs> man, but you know, he was an architect. I mean, they, you know, this man built things. You know, he he wasn't like uh, just a, you know making uh, paper towels. No, he had an appreciation for 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 all the things that he purchased and has has displayed for the world. Well, yeah, so, he was good to uh, yeah. he, he was good at stealing antiquities. Um, so <laughs> you know, inside is a, a crazy array. I mean, you can speak to it too of antiquities, sculpture, furniture, paintings, and uh, paintings by by masters that you would recognize: Canaletto, Turner, Hogarth. And actually, uh, speaking of hidden, there's an, uh, a sort of secret door upstairs that mm -hmm. the doset has to actually open for you. So you can actually see these additional paintings that are sort of hidden uh, inside this little secret compartment. So, you know, it, hidden is a, was a fair way to describe this museum. And it all – okay, again, we're calling it <laughs> obscure, not hidden. Um, but that, that really gets to the heart of this museum, like many of these uh, types of museums. It's kind of like a funhouse, right? Like you feel like you're entering into the mind of John Soane. And there are things to discover around every corner. I remember particularly he has a, a big Egyptian uh, sarcophagus that was a, an Egyptian king – um, thousands of architectural drawings. And uh, I actually went on, on a night that is even more special. So if you're in London, you should check out if this is available. They do what they call sewn lights, which are candlelight tours. Uh, so you can go through the house, very atmospherically lit, and it just brings a whole new dimension of kind of wandering through the, these, these great works of art. You know, the, the, the day that I went, it was, uh, it was pouring down rain mm -hmm. and it was pretty much just me and this, in this one other couple, uh, that had the sort of, were in the entire house, but you know, they, they did make you check all of your bags and your phone and everything. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, you can't uh, take any 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 no cool Instagrams. No photos. No photos. No. Uh, I had to actually buy a few postcards just to <laughs> take photos of, of the postcards. <laughs> just to take yeah, take photos of the postcards. But uh, <laughs> it would be interesting to walk around in candlelight because it's already sort of an eerie. I mean, it's not like a bright museum. You know, it has the feel of a house that's been around for a while. Totally. And 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 to your point about that. You feel like it's an escape from the city of London because it's also on a very quiet sca- square called Lincoln's Inn Fields. And uh, it, it's just steps from major areas, but it feels very secluded and quiet. So it does feel m- more than anything. And the fact that you're saying they take your phones away now, like you're stepping back into the 19th century. Yeah, definitely. You, have to, you actually can engage with the art without having to look at it through your phone, which is nice. I do think you have, uh, you know, two kind of types of museums. One museum that really wants to categorize, that wants to describe and educate, and another that really just wants you to experience what is there. This is solidly in that second experience category. And uh, so it's not overly uh, labeled. It's not, uh, there's not sort of a chronological flow. It's kind of a curio cabinet, which I think uh, makes it all the more fun to wander around. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You can be looking at a, a room full of you know, small sort of uh, British paintings, and then you, you're in, you know standing in front of a, a, a Roman sculpture. So it is it is really all over the map, and uh, you know you kind of get to know sort of how how interesting this guy was too, because everyone around you, wants, you know, who, who works at the museum, uh, is is ready to engage about his life. Deeply devoted. Kind of yeah. 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 Totally devoted. Absolutely. This is like their. I mean, they are experts about this, about these 14 rooms in in London. (laughs) Uh, So that's the Sir John Soane Museum, the number two pick. Uh, Now, number three on the uh, obscure museums of London. See, you got me saying hidden. It's uh, it's just not right. (laughs) These are obscure that are not hidden. This is uh, (laughs) this is the Clockmakers Museum. Okay. Now, I I, I'm a real sucker for people who are deeply passionate about one area, about one hobby, and devote themselves to it. And um, this is certainly true of what is called the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers. The clockmakers were formed. uh, It's a royal chartered guild. It's actually the 61st in the order of precedence of the 110 City of London livery companies. That's something we can go to in another time. A lot of them have places that you can visit to learn about their craft. And uh, this this one, though, they have uh, stuck around, and there are what they call freemen and liverymen of the clockmakers' company. And they still, to this day, are involved in what is called horology. Uh, Ryan, don't I, I can see I can see that you want to make a tasteless joke. Horology is, of course, the study of clocks and watch making. Okay, like you know, keep it keep it. Uh, this is a family show. So, like Apple, they practice uh, horology. Well, I'm, that, it's not exactly that type of clock. We're talking about the more traditional. We're we're talking cogs and springs right. and balance and wheels. They've got all types of timekeeping equipment. So they've got over 600 English and European watches, 30 clocks, 15 marine timekeepers. And actually, the marine timekeepers are sort of the treasure of this collection. And uh, those are timekeepers, uh, I imagine, for a boat. That's right. In the 1600s and, and the 1700s, think about what the British are doing, right? They're going all over the world with their navy, and they are building out the colony. And one of the greatest challenges they had was keeping a time standard on a boat because you're crossing across all sorts of different time zones and you're trying to figure out your latitude, your longitude. And so there was a challenge put out by the British government in 1714. It was called the Longitude Prize. And this was to uh, create a more accurate uh, marine watch? So it was to, to build a device that said, we're trying to, to create a clock that could help us determine longitude at sea. So uh, at the time, it was easy to determine latitude. You basically used the placement of the sun and uh, tables that showed you that related it to the position of the ship. But longitude was a lot harder because ocean navigators needed to know things like where it was headed, the speed they were going at at a given time. So they needed what would come to be called a marine chronometer which would allow them to know the exact time of the fixed location where they were. And from that, they could determine their longitude. Now, if you ask me anything beyond (laughs) that description, the answer is I don't know, okay? It was easy to get latitude. It was hard to get longitude. I mean, I think if you or I were thrown on one of these ships, you know, we're probably being thrown right off the ship, frankly. Well, I would just look down at my compass. I would look up at the sun. I'd say, you know, it's 145. 
It doesn't seem that difficult. Well, I'm not sure you they know. called them compasses, but, uh, you know, <laughs> fair enough. So in 1714, the British government created uh, a, a reward, 10 to 20,000 pounds for anybody who could come up with, uh, with one of these marine chronometers. This is like the world's first X Prize. That's is exactly right. This is the original X Prize. Yeah. I wish governments would do more of this. Yeah, we, I love X Prizes. And uh, there was a, a Yorkshire carpenter uh, whose name was John Harrison, and he's the one who cracked the code. He figured out how to make a timepiece that could be used at sea. It went through uh, versions one, two, three, four, five. And in each one, he was kind of tweaking. I mean, really, it was the original lean startup. He was tweaking little changes here and there. He figured out where the centrifugal force might be uh, playing with it, where the roller bearings were getting at it. Because think about it. You have to create a, a physical device that is not affected by the rocking and swaying of a ship. How was he simulating that, I wonder? <laughs> Can you imagine? I, I'm, I'm, this is a serious I mean, question. I, I assume, you know, if this workshops are rocking... Don't come a knocking because I'm come, trying to figure out if my chronometer can I'm stay on time. Um, and uh, this is the sort of the prized possession of the Clock uh, Makers Museum. They have uh, a John Harrison H5 chronometer, and you can go up and you can tap the glass, and you could pretend that you're, you know, a hardy seaman and that you're heading out to to conquer the world. <laughs> so, so, um. My favorite uh, exhibit, I think, and I haven't been, but this is high on my list now after your thrilling, <laughs> this thrilling story you just told us all. Um, <laughs> it's called Horological, the Cabinet of Horological Curiosity. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Where all the weirdest examples of timepieces are kept. Well, Ryan, it's exactly those sort of uh, crazy, fun, interesting uh, clock types, watch types that you can find if you go to the Clockmakers Museum. I spent a lovely afternoon there. And, uh, you know, I got to say, I'm not a person who's particularly interested in clockmaking. But you I wouldn't am, know it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I am I, I am obsessed with people who love clock making. And by, by right. the time I walked out, I, I got to tell you, I really did want a watch and probably a marine chronometer, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that would. Uh, you know, I actually think that something out of the uh, the, the curiosities cabinet would better suit you, Kiernan. I think so, too. I'm a very you're a curiosity. I am a bit of a curiosity. <laughs> um, and I will uh, just one last note. Uh, th this museum was originally at the Guild Hall. Um, but which is where I saw it, but it has since moved in 2015, it moved to the science museum. So you'll actually be able to see uh, more displays than just the clockmakers museum as well. That's good. Because sometimes people like, you know, a little more than clocks in their museum visits. Well, uh, just wait until we get to the windmill museum. <laughs> <laughs> He's just, not kidding, folks. Just a couple of minutes, folks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're winding the bend here. Uh, the fourth pick for uh, an obscure museum of London. It's the Petrie Museum of Egyptian Archaeology. And Petrie is P-E-T-R-I-E. -E. So and, not like Petrie, like a Petri dish. Well, it's like a Petri dish with an E on there. Yeah, when I, when I first saw this on the, the list that you gave me, I thought this was some sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, museum of viruses. Just a bunch of Petri dishes sitting around. <laughs> Actually, there's here's a, a, here's the Black Plague, you there know. There is a Medical Marvels Museum that's going to be on the next <laughs> uh, two-parter. Oh, my gosh. Uh, um, yeah. And the, the Petri Museum of Egyptian Archaeology is a University of College London museum. The, the next two actually are. And they have over 80,000 pieces of uh, Egyptian art and uh, household items. Super fascinating stuff. And what I like about this is I think that often you see Egyptian antiquities in the in the context of a much larger museum that tries to cover, you know, lots of different uh, nations. This one is solely devoted to Egyptian antiquities. So they go really deep and they have lots of interesting, fun stuff. What is, what is one example of something that you were sort of surprised to see in an Egyptian household? So um, one piece that, the, that, that I, I had seen uh, versions of, but some of the best are here, are when Egypt was part of the Roman Empire, um, the way that they buried people uh, actually changed. And you would have a sarcophagus, but instead of those sort of, um, you know, King Tut uh, golden masks that we think of, they started doing really realistic funerary portraits of the person that was buried. And you look at these portraits, and this looks like somebody that you could work in a cubicle next to. I mean, they're so lifelike and realistic. 
uh, and naturalistic that they, they it's quite jarring when you're walking through, you know, kind of uh, stone god sculptures and paintings of the Book of the Dead. And then you're sort of faced with somebody who you probably just, uh, you know, uh, drank a pint next to at the pub. Yeah, I'm I'm laughing at the idea of sitting in my cubicle next to the Egyptian god Ra. You know, <laughs> well, you got Ra and Ryan. You know, they went in alphabetical order when yeah, assigning they, cubicles. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they also have uh, some very interesting papyri. I, now, I, I personally don't read Egyptian hieroglyphics, but from what I'm told, Mayor Pete does. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, Mayor Pete is, is, is fluent in Egyptian yeah, hieroglyphics. That guy does everything, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, he, he's running for pharaoh, and uh, you know what? I'd be, I'd be all right with it. They've got the only known veterinarian papyri uh, from ancient Egypt, and they even have a medical papyri that covers gynecological issues. Oh, my gosh. Um, and you know, so wait, veterinarians took took notes back then. Well, I mean, I, I think you know, veterinarians barely take notes now. You know, it's just like that's a cat. Yep. <laughs> if I yank on the tail, does it yap? <laughs> yep. All right, he's good to go. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, maybe we should translate these veterinarian papyri and bring yeah. them uh, into today. Um, and and to think that they were even writing down medical treatises. I mean, that that's that's not something that I typically think of when I think about Egyptian hieroglyphics. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sure that this, the medical science wasn't great, though. So we <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure, Ryan. Um, and then um, there's another part that makes them feel uh, touchingly close to modern, which is they, they have a lot of uh, sort of common everyday objects that are grouped in such ways that you can really picture what these people's lives were like. So they have sandals and clothing and jewelry and combs, tweezers, mirrors, game pieces— and and probably my favorite piece in the museum is they even have what they believe was a, a rat trap, a mouse trap in a house that was, you know, that, uh, I mean, something that New- all New Yorkers could definitely uh, relate to. Yeah, you just described a hipster's bedroom, sandals, combs, <laughs> jewelry, tweezers, mirror game pieces, and a rat trap. Yeah, you know. and maybe even a, a gynecological treatise, <laughs> you know. I mean, Most hashtag uh, future is female, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, as it turns out, the past in ancient Egypt, also female. Also female. Cleopatra. <laughs> yep, that's a woman <laughs> from Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, that's the, the Petri Museum of Egyptian Archaeology. This one, uh, Ryan, to your point, actually is a little hidden. You have to go uh, into a university building, kind of through this lane, up a stairwell, and uh, you, you will often be the only one in this museum. And I'll tell you a fun way to see it. This is the way Catherine and I saw it. You can download a scavenger hunt that sort of takes you, uh, challenges you to find kind of the best pieces in the museum. So you know what? I'll link to a good one in the show notes. Uh, you know, if, you, if you, you've got a free Saturday night, uh, it's no longer free, my friend. We're on to the fifth obscure museum of London. And this one, Ryan, I mean, if you thought Clockmakers was narrow, uh, we're going real narrow here. This is the Wimbledon Windmill Museum. <laughs> <laughs> and um, listen, it, it and sounds, this is, it is this sounds connected like to joke. Wimbledon, the the you know the tennis match. It's 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 in that area. Yes, it's okay. uh, it's near Wimbledon Park, which if is you a, said, a lovely if you park. Said, what is more exciting than tennis? I would have jokingly said a windmill. I don't know, museum. watching a windmill blow. <laughs> uh, well, listen. Uh, not only is this museum about windmills, it's inside a windmill. I mean, come on, this windmill was built in 1817. Um, and then it was gutted and uh, turned by devotees into a museum of windmill culture and history. <laughs> devotees. And, uh, it's got, it's got, uh, it, it talks all about the design and construction of British windmills, but it really, it doesn't stop there. It covers the eras and designs of windmills from Persian and Greek straight through to the modern wind turbine. I mean, you're, there's nowhere else, I, I believe on earth, that you're going to learn more about windmills. Do they address uh, the fact that windmills cause cancer? Okay. We are not uh, propagating Fox News <laughs> conspiracy theories on this. I th- in fact, I think if anybody would have the scientific experience to say absolutely definitively and credibly, it yeah. would be the docents at the M- Wimbledon Windmill Museum, who, by the way, are all volunteers. That's right. They are all volunteers, people who love windmills so much they give of themselves and their own free time to show you around Windmill Museum and increase windmill awareness. Windmill awareness. They are windbags for windmills. Uh, (laughs) Ryan. (laughs) And um, they have wonderful little models that I love. I'm going to post some great videos to 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 the Instagram. 
at I, if there's ever been a reason to subscribe, I think it's for these <laughs> windmill um, models. Uh, they actually work, and uh, our of course our Instagram handle at o o o podcast at o o podcast at o o o podcast right at o o o podcast right like ooh 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 podcast and. Uh, are these models sort of like train scale, like the kind you would see yes, in a exactly. Christmas train? Yes, They're gotcha. small uh, models. I, I can tell you, this was years ago that I went to them, but one of the things I most remember fascinated me was that windmills used to be built um, on a rotary, and you could walk out of the house, uh, the, the mill itself, pick up the back, and turn it anywhere in 360 degrees so that it would be facing against the wind, so that the windmill would actually be spinning. So it was, That's amazing. I, listen, it is exactly <laughs> those sorts of amazing facts yeah. that you could learn at these obscure museums. And then, if, as if that weren't enough, it had just the cherry on the cake for uh, Kieran P. Schmidt, which is they also have a, a, a display devoted to the scouts, the scouting movement, the Boy Scouts, because uh, the founder of the Boy Scouts, Robert Baden-Powell, wrote the, the original handbook, Scouting for Boys, in <laughs> Scouting for Boys. <laughs> Actually, Ryan, I think I've seen that handbook on your bookshelf. Um, Scouting for Boys was written just feet away from this windmill at what they call the mill house. <laughs> so no better place to earn your windmill badge and yeah. learn more about the Boy Scouts. Of course, I was a proud Boy Scout. Uh, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. I think all those adjectives describe me to an absolute T. Definitely thrifty. <laughs> thrifty for sure yeah. uh, and reverent I also am reverent yeah. and I'm a, I was in 4-H which was like the rural equivalent to the Boy Scouts Those are, it's, that's like a future farmers of America sort of thing yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, I, I, I've really become a farmer I use a lot of my skills at some point, I would like to do a Boy Scout episode and of course you know no that, that title no longer uh, describes what it is uh, girls are now allowed into the Scouts um, so Baden Powell uh, is tradition going strong so if you're a proud Scout or you enjoy a, a breeze uh, go to the Wimbledon Windmill Museum. You know, uh, Ryan, I, I got to say, it blew me away. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh. The final and maybe the best on the list, Ryan. It's, uh, I don't think you can get better than, than the Windmill Museum. The, you know, if there were any clocks in that Windmill Museum, yeah. it might be the perfect experience. <laughs> um, the, the final one here, it's another University College London uh, museum, and it's called the Grant Museum of Zoology and Comparative Anatomy. So this is like a fun... Gr Grinder is sort of a place you go for comparative anatomy. Oh, Ryan. I know. We, you know, you're just talking about scouting for boys. They're already going <laughs> was to not Grindr. Me. I mean, good God. Uh, sorry, folks. Let's get back to the zoological. Well, I guess actually Grinder in its own way is a bit <laughs> zoological as well. Um, Ryan... <laughs> Ryan, um, that, uh, what I love about this is that it is a, uh, a, a scientific museum. It's more than what you're going to get from your typical natural history museum. The collection goes back hundreds of years. They have 68,000 zoological specimens in their collection. And the collection um, was used for scientific study for, for aspiring zoologists. So they have things like the bisected head collection, where it's a bunch of animal heads that they've cut in half and preserved so that you can see the brain and the eyes and the teeth completely in profile. Wow. Yeah. So, so they, they've been preserved so you can actually just see inside of them. Exactly. That's creepy. And they even have a, a, a whole collection that is just the brain collection. So you can see brains from all different types of animals, all sizes, all different specialty areas. And it just has that sort of creepy feeling that you get uh, for the non-scientist, I would say. You know, I feel like uh, you could really picture Victorian zoologists kind of pointing to the brain and saying, you know, this is, this is where the bat, you know, echolocation is located. This is where the soul is. You see it right there? Yeah. <laughs> This is where the soul is. And um, so they've got, I'll just go quickly say for you, the specimens that they've got, they've got fluid preserved. They've got pinned entomology. They've got taxidermy. They've got skeletons. They've even got freeze-dried. I mean, they've got everything for your zoological and comparative anatomy needs. It seems like this museum could uh, merge with the uh, penis museum that Rick Steves <laughs> yeah, told yeah. Yeah. It seems like they could, that would really kind of build out their, you know, collection of uh, comparative anatomy. You know, walking into this museum, 
um, you really get, you, you're immediately surrounded by bones and big glass jars and antlers. And it just is a very uh, evocative experience. Again, kind of that uh, curiosity cabinet feel about it. And um, one of the things that you can do, even if you're not going to London, but that's uh, awfully fun, is that the entire catalog of specimens is completely uh, online searchable. And they don't have pictures of everything, but you can have a great time just going in and seeing what kind of thing they have. So just to, just for kicks, I went in and searched for platypus, and it came back with seven pages of results of, of platypus specimens that they have. And it, include, uh, it included a skeleton, a preserved specimen of a whole platypus, six dissected and preserved hearts. They had uh, preserved genitals and female cloaca. And don't worry, they do have a picture of that, folks. <laughs> Some sick listener going, <laughs> yes, finally. <laughs> They've got a bisected skull, as promised, and assorted bones from the feet, along with, you know, six more pages of results. Oh, it seems like if you are in the mood for uh, platypus anatomy, there's no place that you should go in London besides the Grant Museum. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I typed in moose. <laughs> What came back was that they have a cast of the complete upper tooth row of moose. Um, they've also got dodo bones there. And uh, one thing to keep your eye out for when you go to the Grant Museum, this has to be my favorite thing that they have. It's a giant glass jar, completely stuffed with moles. Uh, you know, the little creatures that go <laughs> underneath the ground. Oh, I was imagining like Cindy no, Crawford, no, no. like, like the Cindy Crawford just a bunch moles. of beauty marks. No, like, no. In a, We're no. talking about underground blind moles who dig. Yeah. They why have, would you have to put them in a jar? Do you know, it is a huge mystery of the museum why they are preserved in this jar. And uh, sometimes they'll do a guessing game of how many have been stuffed into this jar. Because oh all gosh. you see are these like snoots and limbs pressed up against the glass. It's actually like really, it's, for, for those with, who, who don't have a, a sick... Uh, fascination with dead things. Uh, you may not uh, find it as entertaining as I do, but sometimes they'll do a guess how many moles are in the jar game. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, if you don't want to know, turn it off. There are 18 moles in the jar. Well, you could win that contest now. And we will absolutely be posting a picture of the jar of moles to at OOO podcast. We're going to lose some followers if you post that. Oh, but think of all the quality followers we're going to gain. I'm going to look for those hashtags, see what you, a jar of moles. I just want to see what you come up with for inventive hashtags. You will, yeah. Well, you will immediately see this, I'm sure. So, Ryan, um, just to do the rundown one last time. uh, So, part one of a two-part series, Obscure Museums of London. Number one, the London Roman Amphitheater. Number two, the Sir John Soane Museum. Number three, the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers Museum. Number four, the Petrine Museum of Egyptian Archaeology. Number five, the Wimbledon Windmill Museum, which also includes a special scouting bonus. And finally, number six, the Grant Museum of Zoology and Comparative Anatomy, where you will see a jar stuffed with moles. And, and... <laughs> Uh, well, Kieran, I feel like uh, I've never even been to London. I, I I have not been to the Windmill Museum. I've I've never uh, yeah. You hung probably out with spent, the clockmakers. Spent all your time at Buckingham Palace and at Parliament, and meantime, you've been walking right past the jar full of moles. You didn't even no. know it. Yeah, no. So I will be checking out those moles next time, no doubt. All right, and uh, look forward to part two of London's obscure museums. But Ryan, for now, I think it's time for the last stop. The last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. Now, Ryan, the last stop is uh, your favorite segment, my favorite segment. It's the people segment. That's really catching on. People like to call it the people segment. It's the last segment of the show where you and I each talk about one thing that we've read or tasted or thought about or smelled or experienced that week that kept the spirit of wanderlust alive even during the workday trials of just getting through life. So, Ryan, how did you feed that spirit of travel this week? What is your last stop? Well, in keeping in the spirit of, of museums in London, I actually got in the mail uh, this week from the Imperial uh, War Museum. Mm. My, uh, my account has expired. Oh, my no. membership has expired. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, and the story of how I became a member of the Imperial War Museum was I went to London last year and I wanted to go 
uh, see the Churchill War Rooms. Mm, yes, very and popular museum. Very popular museum. Quite the not, opposite of the obscure. Not obscure, but uh, I'm still talking about it today because I had never been. And uh, you know, I've always avoided that museum because it has mannequins, doesn't it? Mannequins somehow no, don't no, no, sound great to me. They barely have mannequins. Very little mannequins. Yeah, okay. There's no reenactors. It's not like Williamsburg. How or many something. jars of moles do they have? Uh, there. Uh, well, you know, uh, Churchill would would begin every morning with a jar of moles. So, <laughs> like <laughs> Jabba the Hutt in yeah. those frogs. <laughs> Few people knew. Um, but yeah. I, I had be, I could not get into the Imperial uh, War Museum because uh, the, it was full for the day, and they have limited amount of people who can tour. It's a very small museum. Quite popular. Um, but there was, I noticed, a line that said for members. Mm. So what I did was I went to a pub, and I had a, I had a, I had a beer. And on my phone, I bought a membership to the Imperial Smart. War Museum. Smart. And then I went back immediately. And uh, said, and the guy was like, you know, you still can't come in. I go, actually, I'm a member now. And oh. I held up my membership did, card. Did he stand up a little straighter and straighten yeah, his tie yeah. and say, I'm so sorry, sir? Well, I said, you think that Churchill would have let, let this membership line stop him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, was able to get in. And, uh, and how much more time, uh, times the ticket price did you pay to get that? It was, it was only like two times the ticket price. Okay. It wasn't All so right. bad. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's not bad. And it's especially good if members get uh, to bring in a free visitor. Then you just Yeah, and I got, to, I got to skip the line of all these people who had you know, gotten time tickets. Absolutely. Know, very American of me. And, uh, uh, but the museum itself is, is fascinating. Uh, you know, they've built out like a, a, a sort of a more family-friendly sort of historical look at at Churchill and his entire career and sort of a separate part of the museum. Yeah. But the actual, um, uh, you know, the actual uh, war rooms are underground and you can actually uh, you know, see, see where Churchill slept, see where he gave his famous radio addresses. Uh, you can see where people were strategizing uh, his sort of senior leadership uh, were strategizing the war. Um, and it's really fascinating to imagine that these people sort of lived in a bunker that's sort of, you know, right in downtown London. Um, and were, were there for a very long time. And if, if there had been a well-placed bomb, mm. um, you know, they had, they had reinforced the ceiling with, with, you know, pretty heavy concrete, but a, a, a well-placed bomb would have, would have decimated the entire, uh, the entire bunker. So they never, they just never got it. Well, that just leaves it to ask, are you going to renew your membership? I did not renew my membership, but if I go back to the uh, London, uh, I will definitely make an appointment to see the war rooms uh, this time. I think you should buy a membership to the Wimbledon Windmill Museum next time. I think they, they, usually those tickets sell out. Yeah, from somehow, what I I bet I can, somehow I bet the clock museum will let me in day There's out. There's walk-ins. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's, uh, what's your last stop this week, uh, Kierner? So, Ryan, uh, this week uh, I paid a visit down to New York. Uh, so ah, I met you for— Thanks, thanks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, we did see each other, yeah. yeah. And uh, I got to spend a little time with you. Uh, when I wasn't with you, uh, I took in a great show at the Met Museum. Really museum-heavy episode here. And uh, it's a great show called The World Between Empires. And uh, even if you can't make it to the show itself, I recommend uh, giving it a look online. Um, because it's an interesting, uh, it's, it's an interesting show that focuses in on the, uh, area of land, the cultures that lived squeezed between the Roman empire and the Parthian empire. Um, and so it was basically between hundred BC and 250 AD, and it covers what would be modern day Iraq, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen. And you get a real interesting mix and what, what's fascinating about this hybrid of cultures is that you get art that was discovered in the same place from the same time that is of two completely different looks. So uh, you might find a bust that's classical, beautiful, a depiction of a Roman god. And then right next to it is sort of a stone rectangle with two eyes and a nose and a mouth that look like they came out of a Mr. Potato Head set, kind of just glommed on. And these were uh, worshipped and decorated the buildings uh, d d right next to each other at exactly the same time. So it's interesting when you have such different styles that don't kind of meld into one, but live side by side. Yeah, that well, it was the the the, uh, the sort of the, the Roman world around that time was full of uh, uh, incredibly mystic religions, and there were there were uh, I've read a, a fantastic book called City of God, mm. which was uh, about how. In these in these uh, these cities, uh, just there were incredible amount of religions that sort of battled for idea, and and Jesus sort of became the the incredibly popular in that period. But um, was, was there was things like Mithra and other sort of uh, gods that were kind of 
around the same time period. Yeah, and I definitely, there were many, many gods that I had never heard of uh, that were uh, uh, native to this area. And, and oftentimes they were mixing and matching, you know, Roman gods, Parthenian gods uh, to, to, to enter into their worship um, with, by different names uh, with depictions that are very similar. So they had, for example, a series of statues that may uh, depict Hercules, certainly looked like Hercules to me, but they can't definitively say this was definitely Hercules. It might have been a, a, a local adaptation. It might have been He-Man. You know, I mean, a, lot of, a lot of people <laughs> right. look like Hercules to me. Well, I, I'm know? looking at one right now, oh, Ryan J. You. Davis. Thank you. <laughs> and um, but maybe the the most interesting thing that they have there is uh, uh, wall paintings from what is believed to be the world's oldest surviving church. It's a Christian building at at a town called Dura Europos, and it is uh, believed to be the first depiction of Jesus uh, ever. Really, and it, they have it in this show, and they show uh, Jesus walking on water. They they show him uh, healing a paralytic. And, uh, you know, sort of famous stories that even uh, were, were in circulation then. And uh, the thing that maybe scandalized me the most, Jesus didn't have a beard. No beard? No beard. Beardless Jesus. Wow. So for all these years, I've been imagining that blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus with <laughs> yeah. that great beard. That's not, that wasn't him. He was, he beardless. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Those blonde hair depictions of Jesus yeah. are always a stumper. So Jesus would be better played by a young Zac Efron than, say, uh, that guy <laughs> Thor, Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, both of those highly Middle Eastern-looking actors. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. If, you, uh, if you can't make it, do look up this artwork. And they, oft, they also have a wonderful display that I do hope that they make available online in time, where they have modern uh, archaeologists and uh, curators uh, reflect on how ISIS has destroyed many of these uh, areas in, in exactly this space, in this area today. And so I, I think famously, we, we all know Palmyra was right. bombed and chipped away. Um, what gives a little bit of hope, hope, I found, in this exhibition is that lots of the antiquities do survive in museums. And while it was a huge loss to all of us when ISIS destroyed those ruins on the site, you can still get a taste uh, of that culture. So some of it is still preserved. Gosh, and we probably don't even have a full accounting of, of all the, the antiquity that's been lost in that conflict. They've actually been using uh, radar photographs to try wow. to determine. And um, one, of the, one of the videos of a, an archaeologist talking about it says, you know, some people say, oh, isn't it so great? They only de destroyed 5%, it looks like. And he says, but that 5%, you know, it is destroying a people that can never be found again. Right. And right. he had actually visited exactly the sites that they were destroying and uh, spoke about it very movingly. Um, so it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a wonderful exhibition. It runs through June 23rd. Uh, if you find yourself in New York and at the Met, definitely check it out. That obscure museum, the Met, just a <laughs> yeah. small little mom and pop shop, you know. So what are we talking about next week, Kiernan? Uh, next week, we are having a great interview. It's actually an obscure museum of its own. What? Uh, um, here in the United States, in Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian Museum, uh, you know, you know the system. It has tons of uh, great oh, museums. D.C. is a great museum town. Absolutely. And one of uh, the greatest that I've ever visited, we're talking to the director of the National Postal Museum. Oh my gosh, you've told me about it. You've talked about it here in the pod before. There are uh, more stories inside that museum than you would possibly imagine. You, I will have you convinced by the end of this yeah. interview that the story of the Postal Service is the story of America. There are more stories in that museum that you could, you could write on a postcard. <sighs> Brother. Well, until next week, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. The seat taken. You know, I'm still thinking about that that tooth fairy uh, rat. <laughs> oh, you know, you, now you should but, be thinking about a jar of moles. If, yeah, I, can, if I can't yeah. displace it with a jar of moles, <laughs> I don't. I don't think you're ever gonna forget it. You had that. You had that. They had that rat trap probably to protect their teeth at night. Oh, you know, they so were all an interesting early. theory. <laughs> <laughs>